Uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, and we'll start with verse 1. And this part is just sort of a reminder of where we, we've been at. <clears throat> now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran, and Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go in to the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Um, and then also verse, uh, verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, there is a reality that Abraham is learning along the way. Part of it has to do with who the real firstborn is, which, as we have slated and stated many times before, is Christ. And it is not just Christ in heaven, but it's Christ in us if there is going to be a firstborn son. Um, uh, you, you can think of First John chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, uh, Beloved, um, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. But then in verse 3 he says, um, but it doth, or maybe it's verse 2, uh, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, so we are called to be, that's who we are. He's calling us that. We're sons of God. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. Well, I would have thought being a son of God would be the height and the foremost. But when he shall appear, the son, the firstborn son, then we shall be like him. And there is that image. There is that that you be conformed to the image of Christ. There is that travailing prayer, not just a prayer for maturity for Christians, but a travailing prayer that Christ may be formed in us uh, in Galatians. And there is this, <clears throat> this cry from the scriptures, as it were, <clears throat> that are trying to set forth not just our salvation, saved sons, because we're in the family, and that includes the, the ladies, but uh, it's because it's not a gender thing, um, just like the bride isn't, um, as far as, you know, all believers are part of what's called the bride of Christ. But, but above all of that is that Christ in us, is the hope of glory, and Christ in us is where God's heart is. Uh, Jesus is seated as a, at his right hand, and well, why wouldn't God just be totally satisfied with that? Because he's, he wants his firstborn son to come out of us because he was formed in us, and though we were born again sons of God, it did not yet appear, and the word appear there is manifest. It has not yet manifested in us. Maybe we're saved. Maybe we're blessed with you know gifts that we can do work in the ministry and stuff like that. But there is um, a heart desire on the part of the Father 
Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons. But it doesn't yet appear, and it needs to appear, and it will appear, um, because we're going to keep pressing in, because we're not going to make this a religious thing. We're going to make this what the heart of the Father wants concerning his Son out of us. Christ in you is not just your hope. It is the Father's hope. The hope of glory, uh, Colossians 1.27 says. So, but that's one part of this. But the other part of this, uh, that, that's one part that Abraham is growing in, who is the firstborn. And, and again, in this process, he'll pick many, many different people thinking this is God's firstborn. And, you know, uh, it's not going to be real until God's firstborn is there. And it's not just the birthing of the firstborn either. It is the bringing forth of that, that firstborn son. But the second part that I want to mention and, and we'll mention here a little bit is that <clears throat> Abraham is growing in faith. He is, he is uh, and you know, Abraham is considered the father of faith in the Bible calls him that. So as such, um, that we are supposed to have the faith of Abraham. That's what it says in the New Testament. And uh, we begin to see some of these things when God um, told Abraham, he said, leave this land, leave your father's land, as it were, and go into a land that I will show you. All right, so <clears throat> leave your family and go into where I will bless you. <clears throat> so you have... This, this um, I don't know how to put it, a, a confrontation maybe with his um, understanding of faith and his understanding of God. It, it confronts us because God says to him, okay, here is your father's land in Haran. This is your father's land is named after one of his sons. This is his land. And you are, Abraham, birth-wise, was the firstborn of his sons. Okay, he was. So guess who that land would go to? It would go to Abraham or Abram. It would go to Abraham. But God says to him, leave what's settled and worked and secure <clears throat> and go to a land that I'm going to bless you with. It's almost like God's acting like his father, which is not a bad thing. But he also says, leave, you know, your father and leave this, leave these people that are your family and go and I will bring forth a great, in fact, many nations. So, now, while that sounds like great increase going into the land and the promise of God, <clears throat> you have to put yourself in that situation and say, God is taking me away from all my security. God is not sh has not shown me anything. He's just making promises at this stage. This is my family. You're telling me to leave my family, and then, you know, there's going to be way more family, but it's going to be, as it were, from the seed of God that he's going to give me, because my wife is barren. Um, leave this land to a land that's pretty much run right now by foreigners, and they're not foreigners. Abraham would be the foreigner at that point. Um, uh, there is uh, the beginnings then this is, this is the beginning of it. There is the beginning seeds of God planting the kind of faith he wants out of Abraham. Um, for example, I said, I just jotted this down. So, so we see that in Abram, leaving a land, Haran, that belongs to his father is to leave his earthly inheritance. He's leaving what he knows is secure 
He's leaving his earthly inheritance. He now gains the real land of God's heart. He now, but he doesn't in, instantly. That doesn't happen instantly. That means that you have to trust what? We say you have to trust God. Okay, the very concept of trusting God usually means that we're stepping out on the water or we're, you know, in this case, he's trusting that loss is going to be gained to him. Okay? If it's the loss of this land and this inheritance, then that's gain and it will manifest in resurrection as it were. But he will take the death. He will take the loss. He will be with the Lord. So that's what I'm saying. To trust God in that situation is not just to trust God ethereally um, that God will take care of me. It is if if perceived correctly with Abraham, which this will grow and grow and grow as we go through the whole thing, perceived correctly, it will be that he begins to identify very in a very small way right here, but he begins to identify that loss is actually by itself gain without a gain over here. Okay. He's not looking for the proof. He's believing that life comes out of death that that gain comes out of loss, that, that God's strength is weakness, that his way is to lose. Okay, so let's just take the Lord of the whole universe, God himself, Jesus. He's God. He's got all power, but the Philippians says that he gives all that up. He leaves his country with his father. He comes down here in a land full of foreigners. He comes down here and he um, um, sees no evidence. I mean, he's preaching, he's doing miracles, and we go, oh, this is great. But you, you know, though he did, this is, uh, what is it, uh, John 12, uh, I forget the verse, but after 24, certainly. Though he did so many miracles, yet they believe not on him. Okay? Well, you could say, well, they seem to believe they're running after him and stuff. What if it was this? What if they didn't believe on him because they didn't know him? They only knew a miracle worker. What if they didn't know his nature? What if they didn't know his being? What if they only perceived him according to his hands and not his heart? What about that? So... Um, so Jesus does that, and things don't get better. Uh, it is, um, it's interesting to read the Gospels and the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts reading in light of this. Look for every time they bump their heads against problems. And think of it in terms of, instead of the way you perceived it, read it like that, that there's going to be, and you will see it then, because it's there, it's already there. But you'll start reading and go, oh my God, this, all I remembered was this story and what great things happened. I didn't remember that this rushed in and started stomping it out and attacking and doing all this stuff, and they went to another place and a bunch of other people showed up there from this place to make it, you know, to say these people are deceivers and all this kind of stuff. It's it's uh, the the real issue with God isn't I'm going to deliver you from all of that because in most cases he didn't you know um, I, the one de deliverance I can think of was when Paul and Silas were thrown in prison and so they're in prison and you know they're singing to the Lord they're singing to the Lord they're not going. God, you got to get us out of here. You got to fix this. I think they had a different mentality than we do. Yeah. They weren't they weren't screaming, "Get me out of here." They weren't going, "This is the worst part of the journey." They're going, "This is an opportunity to show forth this lamb, the son of God, the nature of God, to bless the Father with an offering that is a sweet savor to him, which is Christ in us in this form, not just Jesus being in us because we're born again." 
and let that rise to the Father. And so they're doing that. They're doing that and it's rising to the Father. But then the, the Father sends an earthquake. It shakes the prison. The jail doors pop open. And the jailer comes running in and sees, you know, oh no, all the doors are open and all the prisoners and, you know, this is bad. And he started to kill himself because, you know, first of all, if the prisoners didn't get him, the magistrates would because you failed. You messed up. You should have da 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 da. And Paul and them, they didn't jump up and run out. He says, wait, hold up. Don't, don't kill yourself. And you know the rest of the story. Paul shares with him. He gets saved, he and his whole family. Yeah. Okay. Well, we would say the miracle is the big deal. Okay. Let's say that some denominations would go, the miracle is the big deal. Another denomination would say the, the salvation of the jailer was the big deal. But what if the big deal to the father was that he saw his son in Paul and Silas who are rejoicing and, and glorifying God and saying, this is a great opportunity to, you know. Um, in many cases, and I, you see that with, uh, with Peter, you know, with the Roman guards, they're chained to the guards so they won't get away. <laughs> you know, what a great opportunity, you know. You know, he ain't going anywhere. <laughs> what a great opportunity, not just to lead him to the Lord, but to show forth the Father's Son in us. You know, do something for him. In other words, not just salvation, but, you know, can I do something for you? Is there da-da-da-da? Can I pray for you? Can I, you know, a spirit that is completely opposite of every other prisoner that that, that soldier has had held to him. Okay, and the father's just going, what a sweet savor this is. See, but you know, we're looking for the, we're looking either for the miracle or we're looking for the great spiritual, you know, kabang. You know, they got saved or something, instead of the small, still voice, as it were. You know, talking about the, the, the small. In the small thing is the great thing with God. In loss, there's actually gain. In weakness, there's actually strength. And the scriptures declare that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that the, the weakness of God is foolishness to men. It's folly. God's strength is described there as weakness. And so how, how was everything won? How was the devil defeated? How was... Uh, the world defeated in the sense of uh, control in our lives. How was all of this, how did it take place? It, take, it took place by God being God, but saying, I'm not going to come down as God, and I'm not going to use my powers to get out of stuff. For example, um, Jesus fed the multitude, 5,000, right? He fed 5,000. Okay. But when the devil tempts him and says, turn these rocks to stone, he won't do it for himself. He's, he's not focused on himself. I, I, could do, I have the power to do it, but I won't do it for me. I'll do it for you, but I won't do it for me. He's hanging on the cross. He's suffering. He's hurting. You know, because we always forget that. I mean, to hang on that cross, they put you in such a manner that your lungs are being cut off You're in the sense of you can't breathe very well. Somehow he could breathe out, Father, forgive him, for they know not what they do. So he comes down. He gives up his strength to, to protect himself. You know, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. I am the son of God. Therefore, I'm not going to leave the cross. Wouldn't it be better for you? Probably physically, but not for you. You know, not for you, not for all of you. And so um, this, these are just pictures that are, the Bible is full of, you know, full of. Um, haven't you ever wondered, like in the Old Testament and the 
all the miracles and stuff like that, nine times out of ten, when God did something, it was with the weakest person or the most foolish person you would expect or in the most foolish manner, you know. I mean, even simple things, you know. It's just, um, you know, when Israel came out of Egypt and they, they're, you know, they finally get to a water hole because it's all desert, and then there's, you know, the in some cases I'm thinking of the the water is poisoned. In some cases there is no water. Um, Moses takes a his rod and he smites a strong stone. He smites it, and that gushes. But in its strength, there was no gushing. There was no water. There was no bringing life to anyone else. But when it was smitten, and when Jesus was smitten on the cross, that's when, you know, that was the greatest thing. Not all the miracles, not all the things, but the fact that he willingly laid down his life. That's the, that's the greatest thing. And it, that's not a miracle. That's just someone with this, as it were, I'll just say it like this, the spirit of the lamb. And of course, then you have that in the book of Exodus where, you know, they've been in bondage for 400 years and Moses goes down there and God says, take your rod and do these miracles and miracle number one, let, you know, let my firstborn go. They won't do it. They'd go all the way through nine, what we call plagues, but they all involve miracles and still no freedom no deliverance, no life until the tenth one. And the tenth one wasn't a miracle. It was the lamb that was slain. See? And then it happens. Then everything happens. So, you know, in light of that, um, you know, if someone were to just start going through the Bible and reading it in light of that and looking for the lamb, looking for the weakness, looking for the loss, and then seeing what happens, you know. Uh, I'm also reminded of, of Elisha when he died and they had buried him in a tomb or something and, and um, so I think it was the Midianites were going by and they got afraid and everything and so they took the, the body of Elisha and they threw it in the grave with the man that was dead and the guy comes alive. Did Elisha come alive? He was alive unto God in Christ, but it was for others. See, so out of that grave, this man comes. Out of this man's death, Elisha, this man comes. It's it's constant. It's it's because it is the faith of Abraham. It's because he was the friend of God because he understood this. And you know, I'm I'm setting up the whole rest of the story with this in mind, but it's this as the faith that God wants us to have and not faith to get out of stuff, you know. Well, you know, I don't want to live Jesus, get me out of this. <laughs> I don't want Christ to come out of me, I just want to be out of this. And we're fighting the very things that God has, has opened for us so that we, we could give him his son. All right, so um, uh, so I wrote uh, the land. So we see that in Abram, leaving a land, Haran, that belongs to his father, he's leaving his earthly inheritance. He's walking off from it. He is saying, even though it's his, he's not fighting for it. You know, when someone dies, usually everybody fights over it, <laughs> right? He's not fighting over it. He's giving it up. But then eventually, and a long time, after much stuff, which is the whole life of Abraham, after much stuff happens, he now gains the real land of God's heart, the real land of God's heart. And as he departs from his earthly family, little does he know that he will appropriate a vast family by means of a barren wife. Barren wife. There it is again. 
God's not using the women who can bring forth. He's going to use the woman that's weak and can't do it and has no strength to, to perform that. And yet, I, I don't know. It doesn't talk about the faith of Sarah. I'm thinking her husband had the faith that stood and brought forth. Um, and God does commend Abraham for it, you know, the scriptures. And then the barren wife. With a barren, empty wife, he will gain more through weakness and loss than he would through strength. To lose is to gain because Abram did it in a faith that believes in loss, weakness, and death as God's mean for increase. So, so <clears throat> two things. There's... If there's, let's just say it like this, if there's death, and we're not even talking necessarily about physical death, laying down your life, like it says in, in uh, 1 John 3.16, by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Um, uh, Abraham, <clears throat> the, the situation with Abraham and the situation with his faith isn't just that you, um, that you go through hard things. It's not just that. But it is that you will go through hard things to bring forth Christ to the glory of the Father. But that's still not the end of it. If there's a death, there's a resurrection, right? Amen. Okay. If there's a loss, there's a gain. Amen. But that gain, get ready, only comes to the firstborn. Because he's the one who laid down his life in you or for you, right? And the father, I mean, uh, God looks at, at Abraham and, and he says, you know, this is verse 7 that we read. He, he appears to him. Now, this is the first appearance of God. He appears to Abraham. Verse 7, let's, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, and, said, and so here's God looking at him, and he says, unto thy seed will I give this land. He didn't say unto Abram. He said, I'm going to give this to the seed. Okay, so again, what if God the Father blessed you did things for you, including miracles and helps and all that. But what if he actually was doing that for his seed? Unto thy seed I will do this, which is Christ, which is the first one. What if that's his first and primary motive? Okay. So uh, we have uh, Galatians. We can turn real quickly there. We're only going to stop for this little bit, although the book of Galatians has so much about Abraham in this whole situation. Galatians chapter 3. Um, Galatians 3, starting with verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet if it be confirmed, no man another nulleth it or addeth to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. All right, so that's, that's the general understanding by most people. Unto Abraham and his seed. And we have verse 7 in Genesis that we just read. God appears looks Abraham straight in the eye and, and says this. This is his first words out of his mouth. Well, actually, this is all that he said. Unto thy seed will I give the land. Okay. Well, he would say to you, just like he did Abraham, initially he said, unto a land that I will give unto you. Talking to Abraham. But now he's saying, I want it because the, the, this is going to build. The whole thing builds. It's like he couldn't say all of this at once or we wouldn't have, you know. We had to be in there at first. Oh, it's going to be my land. <laughs> and then, okay, I'm listening now. 
He says, okay, now I'm going to appear to you. And he goes, oh, boy, this is going to be good. Now he's appearing to me. Unto thy seed is this land. Okay, so back to Galatians. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Okay. Now, what does that mean? If you need me to explain it to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> it means that, um, so everybody puts down, puts in this fact that it is uh, Abraham's seed, and that's the Jews. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is a good time to to break everyone's heart with the scriptures um, still in Galatians. But God wasn't talking about many seeds called the Jews. This is the New Testament. This is the Bible. This says what God had in mind was not them, but him. Okay. Now, in the, in the certainly realist sense uh, in the natural the Jews brought forth Jesus, right, through Mary and Joseph, but, the, but it was Mary and through the Jews. And you see that in Matthew chapter 1 where it says, Abraham begot so-and-so, begot so-and-so, then they begot so-and-so, and so on, all the way down, all the way down, and then Joseph and then through whom Mary brought forth Jesus. So in that sense, they brought forth the seed. And in, but that's just a natural thing. It's t what is that? Just that in itself telling us. It is telling us that God wants us to bring forth his seed. The, they thought, you know, well, I, I don't know. You know, I think that all along, and, and history tells us this as well as the scriptures, they thought that they didn't know who the seed was going to come through. For example, in Genesis. So they eat of the fruit. They fall into sin. And, and God comes down and he talks to them. And he says that there's going to come a seed. It's going to be the seed of the woman. And she's going to come forth. And basically that this seed that's going to come forth is going to be the answer, the one that's going to turn everything around, the one that's going to fix everything. All right. So all the Jews from then on, when they come along, they're going, all the women are going, I could be the one to bring forth the seed. I could be the very one to bring forth the one that's been promised and, and the prophets have spoken of and this is it, I could be the one. Okay, and so they're all going all along, every woman, every woman I want to be the one, I want to bring forth the seed, I want to, that's the promise of God, you know. And so, for some reason I'm just flashed a Monty Python skit, but anyway, so they're going, they're going, I can't. I want to bring forth that seed. New Testament. Jump over to the New Testament. New Testament. Everybody that's born again should be saying, I want to bring forth the seed. <laughs> Not just be a Christian. I want to bring forth the seed of God. And so Abraham, he's saying Abraham, and you know, over a little further is that he says, this is just an allegory. All of this is an allegory. We're the real. This is the new covenant. This is the time of fulfillment. This is where it's supposed to happen in real life. No shadows. No, you know, that was a picture of Jesus. It's supposed to be Jesus. And it's supposed to be coming forth. And it's not many seeds, not Jews, not Gentiles. It's one seed. And that one seed is where? In all of us that are born again. And God is saying, he's looking at us tonight. He's appearing, as it were, and saying, unto thy seed that's in you. Yes. Not you, but you'll get all the blessings because you're the body of the life. 
in that sense. Any outward blessing, it's going to come on you. When I bless my son, it'll bless you. But, you know, but you need to know something deeper, and that is it's not first and foremost about you. It's about, for example, I mean, just salvation. Let's consider that. Salvation. If it wasn't about his son in us, if it was just about getting saved, why did Jesus, when he rose again, why, as it were, did he come into us? Why didn't he just, in every form, stay up there and go, you're saved. Just, hey, everybody tell everybody about what I did a long time ago, 2,000 years ago, you know, and get saved and, you know, now you won't go to hell. <laughs> you don't want to go to hell. <laughs> and, and now you're going to, now, you know, God will do stuff for you, you know. Well, okay, so that's it. We're, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to put it this way. We're like a bunch of little pets that he has. <laughs> and he pets us and he blesses us and he hugs us and he's, we're going, oh, I'm Jesus' pet, you know. The, the, the kitty cats that are outside, they're starving but because I have God as my father. I'm a, I mean, we kind of do, don't we? Sort of, you know, have that mentality instead of saying, it's your son. I want him coming forth more and more. That's what you said, that the promises are to him. So I'm not focusing on me. I'm focusing on more of Jesus, less of me. I quote John the Baptist Amen. or Juan el Baptista. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know why I do that stuff. So, um, so there is this, uh, this, it's like a, it's like a bombshell that goes off in Abraham. And his reaction is what? He falls down and goes, oh, I worship you. No. He builds an altar. He builds an altar. Yay. This is the right path. He builds an altar and says, well, let's bring this son forth then. Yeah. Hallelujah. I mean, of all the things he could have done. I mean, he could have just bowed his head and said, yes, sir. Amen. He could have fallen to his face and worshiped and said yes. But he goes, this calls for an altar. This is about his son, and his son is about altars. Now, spoiler alert, all through Abraham's life, he's going to build altars. You're going to see it one after another after another. Every major thing that happens in his life has to do in his heart with an altar, not with being a Jew or being a Christian or being, you know, it has to do with this seed in relationship to an altar. And so here's the deal. God says, I put the seed in you, but you're going to have to build the altars. Well, how do we build an altar today? How do we do that? Um, when a crisis comes, we turn it into an altar. We don't just, you know, like Jesus, they murdered him, but he wasn't murdered. He was a sacrifice. He turned it into an altar. Like Paul and Silas, when they were thrown in prison, they could have sat in there and said, this is wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. And do that. And where are you? And, you know, all that stuff, which that's why people are freaked out over, you know, well, the Lord didn't. The Lord didn't show up for me. I watched on TV and that guy, he always shows up for that televangelist. But he didn't do that for me and he told me that this was what it was about and he would, but he didn't do that. And God's saying, you know, remember what he said to Peter when he was talking about John? He says, what is that to thee? Don't worry about that guy. What is the Lord saying to you? The Lord is saying, the Lord is saying, I want my son 
and then he's saying, I would like to see what your response is and step back. Will, will it be an altar whereby we'll give him his son? The immediate thing was, he said, I want my son. He hadn't come forth yet, but building altars is a good way to bring him forth, you know? So, so okay, so we don't build altars then. We just go through life. Is God still God? Yes. Are we probably still saved? I would say yes. I think we're saved by grace. I don't think, you know, I don't think it has anything to do with that. But we're not talking about salvation. We're, I'm saved. I'm secure. You know, I, am, I really am. I am saved and I'm secure. Um, based on what Jesus did at the cross and what he bought and paid for, I do not make void the grace of God on that front. But I can't, I don't know, I just, I can't read the word, see this stuff and go, well, you know, I'm going to ignore this. I'd rather have just the good, the good God, you know, God is good. <laughs> yeah, no, God, that's incorrect. God is God. <laughs> you know. And he is good all the time in that sense, but he's not good off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That, and that's what we're looking for. I mean, when we say God is good all the time, many people are looking for, I want good off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, um, well, and let's, let's say this. God is good all the time. <clears throat> God is uh, unto his seed all the time. <laughs> okay, you tell me. You wrestle with that one. It's either us or him. And if we say God is good all the time and we're talking about us, we're already off base. We're already a Jew who thinks that Judaism is what it's all about. Get it? Well, this is the new covenant. I will put my laws in your heart. Hallelujah. I will dwell in you. Amen. I will all these things that he didn't do with them are, are extremely wonderful, but they're wonderful by Christ. They're wonderful because he's the focal point. They're wonderful because he's the fulfillment. We would say, well, um, you know, if you read the book of Hebrews, it's a contrast between Judaism and Christianity. And Judaism is out in the book of Hebrews, and Christianity is in. No, it's not. It is not, and it's not only not, it's not. <laughs> it is a contrast of the old covenant versus Christ. And you read it in every point. You get to it, you'll say, not the sacrifice and da da da, but Christ. Not the high priest of da da, but Christ the high priest for us. Not this and that. It's constantly pointing and saying it's Christ. So apparently that guy got it. <laughs> and it's okay if we get it. <laughs> and I'm going to take a drink while you laugh. All right, but what we're going to find in this journey is we're going to find a lot of things that challenge our, um, where we're at at the time to bring us to where he wants us in faith, in understanding, not just understanding Christianity based on television I mean I mean how long's television been around you know the first church fathers didn't base it on television or televangelists or whatever it's based on the word of god and it's based on going here and seeing what it says instead of what somebody told you it says including me all of this that i've said honestly you if you just believe me, then you'll go out of here and not have it. Check it out. Check it out. What is it? Acts 11. 
they of Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures daily to find out what those things were being taught were of God, were true. Amen. Search the scriptures daily. Amen. I don't have time. <laughs> okay. How about read one verse every day if you get a chance? How about that? Or how about this? Get the, get the word of God on your phone you know, somebody reading it, and play it while you go to sleep. You say, well, that's stupid. I'm sleeping. Your spirit is not asleep. God will still get it in you. You say, well, how do you know that? Does it appear that I... <laughs> when I was in Bible school, they ran us ragged. This place is nice here. <laughs> it is. We were so, weren't we dead? We were so tired but I said, you know, uh, I'm going to play the word and while I sleep. And, you know, I just kept doing that, doing that every night. I just play the word. And <laughs> what she's saying is, man, for real, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. For real to real, man. <laughs> Seriously, I was quoting scripture I didn't even know I knew after a while. I was. It's like, praise God. Because it's not supposed to just go in your head. It's supposed to get into your heart and into your spirit. So, um, there are different ways, there are different means of getting the word into you, but it, it needs to be this word. It needs to be, because the Spirit of God, Jesus said, when he, the Spirit of truth, will come, he will not speak of himself. He will take that which is of mine and show it unto you. Well, he does that by using the scriptures, folks. He does. He uses the word of God. But if you don't have, you know, if you got like 12 scriptures memorized that you use for everything, you know, which there are a lot of churches that that's what they do. They focus on about 12 scriptures and they just quote those all the time. That won't work, you know. I mean, a person can quote a scripture that you, you get a cut and it's like a Band-Aid and it'll go on there and it'll do real well. And then if you get, you, you sprain this finger, you've got 12 scriptures, so you've got one that'll work for that. But you know, what if you get cancer? Your Band-Aid isn't gonna work. You need to know the word of God strong enough that it can, out of your innermost being, can flow. Don't you want to flow? Yes. Rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. Not, you know, I know one scripture. <laughs> you know. I mean, I, I remember being with a group that early on, and one of their favorite scriptures was, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I love that scripture. I still love it to this day. But it was like the devil, any, any problem they had was the devil. And any answer was greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And one day I thought, I think it needs to be greater is he that is in me than me. Let's try that one for a while. <laughs> then we can move on to the world. <laughs> Dealing with the world. <laughs> Amen. What time? Oh, let's see. We don't have another class tonight, do we? So I got... I got all night. Let's see. This girl's trouble. Don't listen to her. Because <laughs> she, she'll sit here. She'll want this all night long. But we are going to find out what the Lord's going to say tonight, for tonight. We're good. With a bare and empty wife, he will gain more through weakness and loss than he would through strength. Okay, so that's, that's me. That's, that's you, Caitlin. That's you, Deb. That's you, Carol. That's all on this side of the room. <laughs> 
We are the barren, yes. Elizabeth, that she was called barren. That was her identity. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's about bringing forth the seed, but she did bring forth the seed because John was the very essence of what Christ was. Decrease. Christ mm -hmm. increased in him. Decrease. Mm -hmm. He was filled with that. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, she brought forth the true seed. She was barren and brought forth the very essence of that. Right. Um, you see that. Barren. Barren, unable to bring forth Christ. Is that the end of the world? No, it actually might be better off than those who can. What's, what's it say in, what is it, I, uh, Psalm 22, is that what it is? Rejoice, O barren, is that over in Isaiah 54? Okay, so rejoice, O barren. What is that? Help me here. What is that saying to us? It's saying there's hope if you believe in life out of death, if you believe out of weakness um, uh, is greater than strength and will bring that forth, but that's where the starting point is in God's heart. That's right. It is the faith of Abraham and his faith and his views will change. It's, it's like a metamorphosis. In fact, it is a metamorphosis. It's, it's, it's a, uh, when it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, <clears throat> when it says that when we look into his face, we will be changed, the word there is metamorphosis, a change from a caterpillar to a butterfly, change to a dirt crawling creature that can only go so far to a butterfly that can fly all over the place. Um, but there's an interim thing between the caterpillar and the butterfly. What's it called? Coon. It's the death. It's the darkness. It's go into that with his spirit and don't call it a crisis. <laughs> you know? Yeah, Robert? I just, I just was sitting here thinking about... Um, Sarah, that there's one thing she wasn't going to do, and that's bring forth another seed. Right. She was going to bring forth this seed, and, and I just see that bearing, you know, it, especially if we understand it and are willing to consider ourselves only for the seed. Right. That's, that's good, amen. Well, and you look, you know, so, you know, Sarah's thinking within herself, you know, I got to, I got to bring forth Jesus. I got nothing. I want to bring him forth, but I got nothing. Abraham is saying, he's talking to God and it's all that he ever talks about is this seed that's going to come forth. I got nothing. <laughs> um, Every year that passes by is getting closer to for sure nothing. I got nothing. When I hear uh, of what? <laughs> I got nothing. You remember this thing when it fell over when we were Korean? Do you remember that? We were in a solemn assembly, and it might have been the same one. It was the same one. It was the same one. And we were having a solemn assembly, and we were all sitting down on the, uh, in different places, and we're searching the scriptures, and we'd set aside days and stuff like that to, cut, to seek the Lord. And it was great because we'd have you know, all this time to read the Bible or pray or just meditate and be before the Lord. And... Um, and I was sitting down here, and I think you were close, right? But you weren't right where I was exactly. You were just over here. And, um, and, um, and I was seeking the Lord, and I think I was sharing something with a couple of people that were sitting around me. And this thing started 
tipping over and it fell down on me. What did, do you remember the end result? Something happened there. Oh, I sprained my arm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Actually, I really truthfully, I got nothing. <laughs> I just wanted to be the Lord. I don't. I just wanted to be the Lord. It's gonna look at this. This is great. <laughs> it's saying this weight of chalk that says barren is too much for me to bear. <laughs> you know, that chalk has just tipped the scales. I got nothing. I'm falling all apart. I'm falling over. All of that has nothing to do with the Lord and his heart. All of that has everything to do with his plan. His plan. You're barren. You can't. And like Robert said, you can't bring forth the wrong seed in a certain sense. You are slated for the right seed. And that's what he's going to bring forth out of you. That's your hope. That's your hope. Mike Gentry. Amen. Well, we should stop before this thing gets me behind me. This is good stuff, isn't it? And it really is going to pick up momentum. It's going to pick up some good momentum. And it's going to be helpful right at these early stages. It's just too early to be able to get your, you know, your, your teeth into the meat of this thing. But as it goes, Abraham will pick up momentum and we'll pick it up with him and we'll see what God is doing. And then it'll help us to better identify what's going on in our lives instead of I'm an earth being like every other earth being that lives on the planet and these things are happening that I like and these things are happening that I don't like and, you know, uh, oh God, help me instead of you said you would bless your seed, you know. Bless me in a way that I can bring him forth. Gosh, it's hard to stop, but I mean, you think about the parable of the sower. You know, the parable of the sower, you know, or the parable of the, the treasure. How about that one? The, the very short parable, a, a guy, uh, there was treasure hidden in a field, and he went and he dug it up, and he, but he bought the field to get it. He bought the field, and then he dug it up. But so, you know, if we're the dirt and he's the treasure, then he takes a shovel and he like this and we go, oh, Lord, oh, why are you doing this to me? Why are you allowing this? Or why are you doing this? Shovel deeper this time, put, taking away some of our dirt. And we're going, what is going on here? This isn't right. Da, 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 da. And if you would take the time to listen, he would just say, I'm not trying to hurt you, I'm trying to get the treasure out of you. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God's after the treasure, God's after his seed, God's after the firstborn out of us. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you as you, you lead us, not just in a Bible school class or some sort of a church service, but as you lead our hearts, Lord, like, like a hungry animal to, to be led to, to true waters and to, to be fed the manna from heaven, that which, which comes from you down to us, which is Christ, to fill us, and to, to, to be supreme in us. Father, we ask you, let these days and times and moments not not pass by and just be another thing that we will forget, another thing that we will have lost, another thing that will have no power in our life. But let us pray not just now, but between now and the next class. Father, that we may pray, not I but Christ, that we may pray, he must increase and I must decrease, that we would pray, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. That we may pray, Lord, open my heart more. Open my heart more to what's in your heart. I don't want to just live like a brute beast on the earth. I want to live as a vessel of the life of your son. Father, quicken these prayers in us. Touch us.
in a way that will be open more and more. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Bless you guys.